And welcome. So my name is David Stevens. Um, I'm vice chair of the SIBSI facilities uh, management group and a trustee board member of SIBSI. And therefore, on behalf of SIBSI and the SIBSI Hong Kong region, um, we welcome you to this um, lunchtime seminar on international FM and the view from Hong Kong and the UK. We have two fantastic speakers today. We're being hosted um, in Canary Wharf by ISS. And thank you very much, ISS, Hong Kong and UK. Um, for hosting us um, today. The presentation will be recorded and added to the um, SIBSI YouTube channel, so you'll be able to re reflect, um, share, like, and hopefully people are hearing this in a recording in, in many, many days' time. Um, so the two presenters we have today, we have um, Vincent Ma, the um, CEO of ISS um, Hong Kong and a former chair of the SIBSI Hong Kong region. We also have James Saunders, who is ISS UK's um, commercial director for healthcare. And you have myself just mopping up at the end. And I'm David Stevens. I'm also a director of the state's facilities and capital development um, within the NHS. If you have any questions, uh, by all means, uh, put them in the chat. Um, we've got um, Jack monitoring the chat. And at the end of the session, um, which should be uh, just under an hour, um, we will um, look for any of the chats we've got in there. And also we will be able to have open mic questions as well, if you would like. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to um, hand over to um, Vincent. Hello, hello, uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon or good evening. <laughs> Actually, uh, today is a tricky time. Um, I know that uh, right now is also, as mentioned by David, um, lunch time uh, in London and also uh, dinner time in Hong Kong. So I promise, I promise uh, you guys, uh, we, we would well manage our time to make sure you will have your lunch and dinner later. So, Stay hungry a little bit. Uh, let me share with you. Um, all right. So uh, facility management best practice from Hong Kong. So um, this is my uh, first part. And uh, for the second part, of course, I would also update a little bit about uh, SIPSI Hong Kong region. And before that, I actually would like to share a little bit about my background. I've been uh, working in this industry 25 years. And uh, for my first 10 years, I uh, spent my time in a uh, design consulting firm and then uh, joined FM firms in different companies. Now the CEO of uh, ISS Hong Kong. Um, I got my chartership uh, more than 15 years already and uh, also very active in different uh, professional bodies such as uh, of course, SIPSI and uh, locally in Hong Kong, IE, IFMA, SRA. And um, also two years ago, uh, it was a very challenging time. Uh, I would like, uh, I would of course share with you a little bit more uh, what we have been doing in the Hong Kong SIPSI. All right. So a bit um, background about um, ISS Hong Kong first. Uh, we have more than uh, 14,000 placemaker employees. Um, running all the uh, FM operation, uh, single service, multiple service, and uh, also the IFS service. Um, if talking about FM facility management, uh, I would like to share a little bit about the operating model. Um, so I distinguish it into uh, two models. Uh, one is the, um, the something like the management agent model. Uh, which is also something like the supply chain management. That means uh, the individual uh, specialist service and all different services uh, would be outsourced to different uh, the specialist contractor. So uh, what the facility managers are doing, uh, mainly like the agents to coordinate uh, different contractor service provider and to uh, deliver the uh, solution to the customer. And, um, and the another model uh, would be the 
uh, will integrate the model uh, by providing the service uh, through the self delivery approach. Of course, uh, not 100% we can uh, self deliver the service uh, because for some of the uh, what we special service, uh, such as the uh, lift and escalator, uh, must be outsourced to the, um, the licensed, uh, qualified uh, lift and service uh, service provider. But for all the other service, for example, uh, security, cleaning, landscape, pest control, uh, management, everything uh, in this model should be all under the self delivery approach. So for that approach, that means uh, the communication, the coordination uh, must be more effective and even the overall productivity uh, must be higher. So uh, this is we let me the self delivery approach. And if um, talking about the, uh, the hard surface, the management, uh, of course, one of the uh, right now, uh, one of the common terms would be the asset management. And what's what's about the asset management or uh, an ISS will let me the total value of ownership. It's all about um, we treat every facility system components down to the uh, the spare part. We treat it as the asset and uh, just like a cycle and we maintain it as a cycle. Uh, at the day one, we connect every data and then to do the analysis to assess the uh, component system facility condition and to further formulate uh, the, the, the replacement cycle. And just uh, like you can see this circle. So um, this is uh, one of the, uh, right now, I would say uh, in the hard service, the approach, uh, assets management approach. But in terms of the uh, outcome, when it was outcome, uh, actually we can um, we can see uh, different outcomes uh, by different uh, perspective. For example, uh, for the uh, stakeholder view, uh, it's all about something like uh, the people. Uh, if uh, based on this approach, of course, uh, we can also focus on the web page experience because um, this is all about uh, the user experience. And uh, in, in the coming slide, I will share with you more about the user experience. And of course, uh, this approach, uh, uh, we would like to achieve the compliance uh, because, you know, different system, different components, and yeah, everything, uh, we have the standard. So uh, this is all about one of the outcomes should be the compliance related approach outcomes. And um, by different of the uh, data, and uh, also we can see one of the outcome must be the performance. Uh, by different of the, um, the, the, the condition, um, and then uh, by different of the parameters, the set point or blah, 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 et cetera. And then we can know uh, the performance and the, and it also uh, is um, finally, of course, uh, aims to uh, increasing the, uh, operational performance as well as the business goals. And um, again, uh, also by using of this approach uh, is all about the consistency and scalable outcome. Uh, because uh, when we know everything, as I said earlier, we can also formulate our strategy. Actually, you know, in the operation and maintenance world, uh, we don't have a single formula. It all depends on different uh, building. Uh, it all also depends on your your resources. If uh, you don't have the resources, of course, uh, we cannot invest a lot. So it all depends. But um, it also talk about uh, the outcome would be finally to formulate tailor make the strategy of your building of your building facility. And um, in terms of the Access level, uh, we can of course uh, differentiate and categorize different of the um, the components, system, facility into different level. And uh, as I said, um, so of course uh, this is only uh, our ISS uh, approach, uh, but all the others approach in Hong Kong would be quite similar. It all depends on different category, 
and uh, you can split it into a uh, different uh, component. For example, if talk about uh, air conditioning, we have so many components, chiller, AHU, fan coil units, down to even the, the water valve. So um, we can uh, coordinate everything, uh, consolidate everything together, and then to set the, um, you can see the set the uh, parameter and to know uh, the, the further uh, maintenance plan, the frequency, so we can see the uh, maintenance methodology finally by the uh, different all information consolidated to further uh, set our assets management episode and to further plan our our um, resources uh, for the longer term. Of course, uh, one of the deliverable I would say uh, must be uh, in Hong Kong. I would say most commonly would be the five year improvement plan or yeah, uh, the terminology is a uh, uh, lot of key, uh, but uh, the five year plan to uh, replace, upgrade uh, the facility and uh, different equipment uh, would be one of the deliverable. And then, as I said earlier, uh, we can also place on the condition different uh, information to well plan our maintenance schedule. And um, so in ISS, of course, uh, we have something, uh, the technology is similar uh, to, to, to plan, uh, to make use of the uh, technology to well plan and, and to set uh, the strategy, uh, FMS at ISS. But in, in the market, in the industry, there are lots of different um, technology solutions uh, to, 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 to well uh, manage and the ambits to uh, well formulate the maintenance schedule and uh, for every uh, the uh, facility manager uh, to make them easier to to produce uh, the the plan and also to well set the uh, longer term uh, maintenance uh, schedule. Of course, in Hong Kong, a little bit different uh, to UK. You can see uh, this picture is uh, taken at the peak of the mountain. You can see uh, a big, big difference must be. We have so many skyscraper, high rise building, and when we condense area. So what does it mean? It means actually, of course, uh, we have about uh, 500 uh, new building a year, and also we have so many existing building with a uh, 45,000 building, and uh, just yeah, roughly uh, around 65 percent of that already aged over 20 years. So you can imagine uh, most of the building facility and equipments also already deteriorate and in ancient condition. So it's really, really about time. And so that's why in the coming slide, I share with you uh, some other uh, approach yeah. by government. And uh, what I said is that user experience is also one of the approach right now in Hong Kong, uh, because you know, uh, from day one, uh, all the design, all the um, design, you know, uh, based on the, uh, I would say, um, the um, original, uh, the um, the many different uh, guidebook standard, maybe uh, the design is 100% occupancy, uh, the temperature, and also uh, the operation uh, forecast, blah, blah, blah. But, Always, uh, the reality after several years, and as I mentioned in the previous slide, after 20 years, uh, do you believe everything is still same as day one, set point? Of course not. So nowadays we talk about user experience, so you can see the picture. So always is derived from uh, day one design. So that's why we need to do uh, the asset management approach. And of course, um, the traditional approach, we always say uh, the breakdown maintenance, routine, corrective maintenance, low complaint approach, but we are losing uh, the efficiency and losing a lot and also our cost, <laughs> our money. So uh, the best part is what I mentioned about asset management, we need to know the condition base, we need to know the, the operate, optimized point of the operation and uh, of course, another one hot topic nowadays uh, would be the IoT application. How do we integrate them to be the smart FM? 
So another term would like to set, uh, would like to say would be uh, um, in Hong Kong, uh, government also launched uh, the uh, virtual commissioning. So uh, actually something like uh, what I mentioned earlier about the asset management is all about um, uh, based on the uh, user experience, based on the current condition to well plan, uh, to do the data analysis, uh, and then to well implement the upcoming uh, the maintenance cycle. And then to, of course, set different energy saving opportunity with Lamy DESO. But of course, uh, different, different industry, different uh, countries may have uh, other terminology. But I would say uh, the approach is like that. Uh, one of the main difference uh, uh, between Hong Kong, UK, I would say, of course, Hong Kong weather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in Hong Kong, uh, we used a lot of the trailer uh, air conditioning. So, uh, that's uh, most of the uh, energy saving opportunity uh, will be coming from the uh, chiller essential plant. You can see uh, even adjust the chiller water temperature, the uh, the water condensing temperature. We can save a lot. So it all depends on uh, what you can do, and then you can uh, save a lot of the money. And again, uh, sustainability technology and innovation must be the hot topics. And uh, so these few pictures uh, you can see also the high rise building when we come in Hong Kong, <laughs> everywhere. And the trends, uh, smart FM, so just a uh, very, uh, some of the bullets. So um, another hot topic must be the labor shortage. I know that every country, every cities are facing similar problems. Uh, so how, another question is how do we integrate the um, technology and IoT and then to to save a little bit of our manpower. Because every one of you know, uh, know that, um, of course, uh, we cannot say everything uh, to be to be done, to be kept out by uh, the robotics, uh, but uh, we can still integrate some of the service uh, by using of the uh, automotive and uh, innovative approach. So uh, nowadays, I know that again, uh, so many things uh, we can uh, make use of the IoT. Uh, for example, the occupancy sensor, the temperature, even the building condition. Uh, we can use some of the um, infrared scanner uh, to scan the building rather than just only uh, by the uh, by the uh, by the technician or engineer uh, by using of the whistle inspection something something. So a lot, a lot of different uh, technology nowadays. I know. Uh, so just uh, harness some uh, to, to 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 do, uh, which is uh, quite common in Hong Kong. And of course, uh, the dashboard. There are lots of different dashboard. Uh, and uh, the purpose of the dashboard is to to let the operator know the condition, the situation, what is going on, what is happening, and you don't need to uh, to have the um, a fixed post of the technician. And you can you can also uh, to see the uh, alarm, uh, the P alarm level, just uh, depending on uh, different uh, facility, different equipment, and depending on uh, your setting. So uh, it's all flexible. But um, the aims of the, the dashboard, the aims of those uh, the, the the controller is a uh, basic. It's one of the fundamental things uh, for the uh, building operator, uh, the facilitator to. Uh, to monitor, to well manage, uh, by all means, I would say, uh, not just only the current condition, uh, but you can see uh, we can uh, even some of the uh, some of the manufacturer also have different, you know, the energy management program. So you can see everything uh, on the same platform. Uh, even uh, you are outside the office, you can also use the uh, uh, iPhone, your iPad or blah, blah, blah. And then you can see the real time, uh, the energy consumption. So um, this is also one type of the uh, optimization, one type of the innovation technology. So uh, another hot topic, of course, uh, the sustainability in Hong Kong. One of the uh, standard uh, we uh, commonly using is the ISO uh, fourteen thousand one, and uh, by using of that, uh, it also set different uh, guidelines standard uh, for the facility manager to use to follow. 
and you can see uh, some of the uh, quite um, uh, common uh, uh, in Hong Kong, not just only the ISO, but also the uh, well standard and also some local standard beam, uh, beam, beam plus are also very common in Hong Kong. So, which is uh, also um, using uh, nowadays in Hong Kong uh, to, to follow the uh, sustainability and also the environmental management. Um, this is a one case and actually not the only one case uh, in Hong Kong quite uh, popular nowadays uh, to, to install the uh, PV panel uh, at the rooftop and uh, make use of the solar heat and then to well generate a little bit of the uh, power supply. And this is a uh, uh, one project, uh, John effort together with the uh, city and also CLP, one of the power companies. Uh, so there's so many different um, similar uh, program in Hong Kong, the incentive program to promote, to encourage the people, the, the facility manager to make use of some renewable energy. So uh, this is quite common in Hong Kong nowadays, but I guess uh, must be something similar in UK. Maybe. <laughs> As waste management is another topic, hot topic um, under sustainability. So um, also again, this is uh, one type of the uh, a smart thing, smart waste management system. Uh, the aim is to um, to count uh, the waste management, uh, how much you spend um, about the waste management every day, every week, and every month. Uh, we need to know the trend. We need to know uh, the data for further analysis, the pattern of the uh, waste consumption. So this is uh, one of the uh, uh, the software, the technology um, for us to to well understand, to well know about uh, the waste consumption, and then to plan the mix. So all about um, if I talk about. Uh, my company, ISS, of course, uh, we have uh, so many different uh, the software and the apps. Uh, but I know that uh, in the industry in Hong Kong, we also have different manufacturers doing similar. Uh, but what I would like to share with you uh, would be uh, make use of the technology and uh, we can have a more easier life. <laughs> and um, one of the, of course, um, one of the core I would say in facility management must be people. Uh, yeah, some people always say uh, FM facility management is also a people business. Uh, just like uh, I remember David also served me. <laughs> yes, I totally agree with, with him. And uh, actually with the people, yeah, I don't think you can talk more about technology uh, because most of the service are actually under facility management. We still need people to operate, to run, and also uh, to well monitor our building. So, um, so people is very important. Uh, we also need to train our people up. We need to develop our talent. We also need to retain our talent. You know what? Actually, every year, I know that your company must uh, spend a lot for recruitment. So uh, we need to well manage our our people turnover. So uh, we need to set a well uh, developed program. Uh, if talking about engineer in Hong Kong, we also um, have a, a different scheme. Uh, in Hong Kong, one of the quite popular scheme in Hong Kong would be the Hong Kong IE a scheme made training scheme. Uh, but um, not about that. Uh, apart from that, also we have so many different uh, training uh, in uh, different uh, companies. I, I know that. So, uh, but my uh, aim is okay. Uh, encourage all the uh, all the uh, employer to well make use, uh, allocate your resources to retain the people, train up the people. So this is uh, one of the very fundamental thing we need to do. And um, another topic I would say nowadays, not just only uh, FM, uh, but all different uh, industry, uh, one of the <laughs> hot topic must be the diversity, inclusion and belonging. So uh, this is uh, one of the hot topic. Um, so in the past, uh, I know that engineer seems like uh, just only the, uh, 
the male uh, people uh, can do, uh, but nowadays also we encourage uh, female engineer. So this is uh, one of the DNIB. So, uh, so I would also encourage every uh, of the senior leaders also uh, encourage your team uh, to well train and uh, offer different opportunities to your female women uh, leader uh, to join our FM and engineering industry. And of course, uh, so just like in other countries uh, in Hong Kong, so many license uh, uh, qualified qualification uh, request by the government if you want to uh, do uh, the technical service facility, facility management. So uh, I won't go through details about that. And again, awards and recognition is also playing another, another important role in Hong Kong. If talking about facility management, of course, uh, I think one of the common award would be IFMA. And uh, of course, also SIPSI, we have the SIPSI FM award. So, uh, so award and recognition, we need to recognize the people. We need to recognize uh, the facility management people. You know what? Uh, in the new build buildings, always uh, we have a lot of the different awards, uh, but for the FM awards, we need to uh, also make it be more common. So uh, I would encourage all of you to John to recognize your FM team so that uh, they can feel something different. Right, just uh, some FM projects in Hong Kong. But uh, I would like to also spend a little bit about um, uh, my experience, uh, what I engage, uh, engage uh, in SIPs uh, so far over the past uh, few years. Um, of course, uh, we have our strategy, uh, better building performance, growing membership, sharing knowledge, strengthening our voice, and increasing engagement. Uh, but one of the purposes is how do we link the strategy and how do we bring the strategy to life? So we need to do a lot. Uh, in my terms, so you can see the picture very special, very funny. Uh, so yeah, all of us are wear, wearing the, yeah, we're wearing uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the surgical mask, because uh, it was a very challenging year in uh, 2021. Uh, but I even also done the uh, retreat during that year, invited uh, almost all the past year together to share, elaborate, exploring uh, some different things and for a longer term of the SIPC Hong Kong. And of course, as I mentioned, one of the most uh, important events to engage the industry Professional uh, particular must be the Sipsi Hong Kong Award. But you can see again, we wear the, the mask. And then another major event, uh, Hong Kong Joint Symposium. Growing membership always must be one of the uh, agenda, important agenda. Finally, just uh, my final slide, uh, the focus. Of course, as I mentioned, how do we bring SIPSI strategy focus to life? So a lot of things we need to do and uh, also strengthen the core position of SIPSI Hong Kong region, more collaboration with the industry and across the region uh, to uh, SIPSI headquarters and uh, share more knowledge because we have a very, very brilliant uh, SIPSI guy and different uh, uh, technical me me uh, memo and also building the building performance and of course, finally growing our members. So again, uh, thank you very much. Um, my uh, final advice to all of you, uh, we don't have a single formula, single equation uh, to do the best FM, uh, but we have the best practice and uh, all rely on you. So uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Vincent. That was absolutely outstanding, especially as you said, you didn't have much time to prepare slides. That was fantastic. I'm looking forward to some Q&A at the end. And thank you so much for giving up such a valuable amount of your time, uh, your short time here in the UK. We really, really do appreciate it. It now gives us great pleasure to hand over to James Saunders, and you'll see me slide the laptop across as we're sharing here, um, the uh, Healthcare Commercial Director for ISS for the UK view. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Just give me two seconds while I share. Uh, 
Brilliant. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, David. And thank you, Vincent. Uh, thank you for giving me the uh, opportunity to uh, to talk to you guys on the call and, and in the room. Um, so just a little bit of introduction. So, yes, I'm James Saunders. I have been with the ISS business for just over three months. Um, and um, prior to that, I've had quite a, a varied career working with various service providers, uh, providing FM services to mainly public sector um, properties um, with a focus on healthcare. But actually over the past four years prior to this role, uh, worked directly for the NHS. So spent some time with guys at St Thomas's, King's College Hospital and uh, Lewisham and Greenwich Trust. So I like to think I've got a, a good understanding of the sort of the states and facilities landscape within uh, healthcare. So just a little bit about um, ISS in the uh, in the UK in the healthcare market. So we work with just over 30 uh, trusts. Um, we have around 11,000 members of staff or placemakers. Um, we provide a lot of soft FM services. Um, so whether that's cleaning, catering, uh, patient catering, portering, switchboard. Um, we've got quite a wide range of services that we provide. Uh, we also provide hard FM services across a number of uh, PFIs in the uh, in the UK. Total turnover is um, just over 350 million. Our key part of my role is to uh, retain all that business and also uh, win a new business. So hopefully that will uh, grow in the future. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so we've been a long-standing kind of partner um, of the NHS and they're very proud of, of, of our relationships that, that we've got with them. And there's some really long-standing uh, relationships where we've worked with customers for kind of over 15, 20 years. Um, so particularly proud of, of, of those things. So today I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, kind of ISS in the context of, of, of healthcare. Going to spend a little bit of time talking around um, kind of what we do in the hard FM arena, um, but also what we do then in the soft FM space as well. But a common theme throughout this slide sort of presentation is um, how we're working with our customers, how we are trying to better understand how our services make a difference to our customers and making sure that our services um, provide the best for our customers. So, as I say, we obviously work within the NHS. So, for those who don't know, certainly for, for, for the people um, from international colleagues on the call, the NHS is an absolute beast of an organisation. So, it's got over 200 uh, individual trusts, um, 1,200 hospitals, floor space of 25 million square metres. Um, and I think one of the most impressive stats for me around the NHS is the number of people that employ. So it employs 1.2 million people, which I believe makes it one of the biggest employers in Europe and probably in the top five or six employers of the world. Um, so it, it is a very, very big uh, organisation. Um, you'll see interesting in the, in the bottom right there, um, there are a number of new hospitals uh, that are going to be built. Although I think the government has uh, taken some dramatic sort of, sort of poetic license around actually what new hospitals mean, and that gradually seems to be uh, changing um, yeah, the definition of that. Uh, one bit just to pull out here, you'll see that 62% of the NHS uh, remains insourced. Um, so, um, yeah, which just kind of gives you an idea of the landscape when it comes to sort of outsourcing and, and, and insourcing. Um, so that's, yeah, just the sort of the market that we that we work in. <laughs> And I just wanted to pull up uh, the vision for healthcare for ISS. And I'm just going to pull out, I think, two kind of things here that are linked, and that's around our purpose led culture uh, and also solutions that impact on patient experience. So, what do we mean when we talk about that? So, historically in FM, if we kind of go back, uh, it was, used to be a fairly transactional uh, relationship. So, a client might say to us, you know, we want three cleaners and two porters. And, and we would give them a, a cost for that. But as the relationships have matured and as, as the industry has matured, um, you know, we're now working with our customers in a much more collaborative way. And for us, it's understanding how our services make an impact on patients. So in the past, you know, a cleaner might have just said that they're a, a cleaner, but actually a, a cleaner on a ward is helping to reduce infection rates which in turn helps um, reduce sort of patient harm and, and, and an age recovery. Similarly with our hostesses that serve a meal, we know that 
nutrition is an absolutely vital part of a patient recovery. And therefore, if that hostess um, you know, serves them in the right way and that improves uh, the amount of food that, that that patient eats, then that aids their recovery and increases the time that they're going to be, uh, uh, decreases the time that they're going to be in hospital. And then similarly, our, our porters. So our porters will move patients around the hospital. But we've seen firsthand that if that porter really makes an impact or makes an effort to have a conversation with that patient whilst they're taking them from the ward to x-ray, that can really improve that patient's experience and, and their stay. Um, I mean, similarly with the hostess, you know, our really good hostesses are the, are the ones that remember how the patients like their cups of tea. Um, and all of those things have a huge impact on, on patient experience. So it's kind of moving from that transactional relationship to that more working together and helping to sort of achieve helping our customers achieve their strategic objectives. And that's really what we talk about when we talk about being purpose led. It's understanding the outcome and it's understanding the impact that our services have um, and where we can make a difference. So that's the, um, the vision uh, for our business in, in healthcare. And now I just want to talk a little bit around um, the hard FM piece. And I'm not going to talk too much about technology. Uh, what I am going to talk about is piece of work that I've been doing over the past couple of months with my team. So we are mainly a soft FM provider in uh, in, in healthcare. Um, probably 10 to 15 percent of it is, is hard FM, but we're keen to kind of grow that because we do think there's opportunity out there. But one of the things I've been trying to do with my team and our existing customers is to understand how our hard FM services can make a difference to our customers um, and what we think our customers are looking for from a hard FM uh, service provider and this is something that we've kind of been working up over the, the past couple of months so this is you'll see that this isn't massively technical this is more aimed at um you know the sort of c-suite of, of colleagues in, in in the nhs um, and these are what be the we believe are the sort of sort of key pillars that our service offering can provide to our customers so i'm just going to talk through these in a, a little bit more detail so firstly assurance and compliance. So an absolutely key part of our service is providing assurance to our customers that we are doing everything that we are needed to do under, under our sort of statutory and, and mandatory obligations. And just to kind of more we'll draw the distinction between assurance and reassurance. For me, reassurance is just telling your customers that, you know, everything is fine. Assurance is actually providing the data and the evidence to, uh, to, 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 yeah, to, to show what we're doing. So for us, that is a, a key part, and we know that you know the execs of a trust want to make sure that um, we're doing everything that needs to happen to keep them out of jail. Linked to that is risk management. So our customers often have um, an aged estate, and inevitably that that creates risk. So we want to work with our customers to understand, identify those risks, make those risks visible, and then put in appropriate kind of mitigation and management strategies to to, to reduce those risks. I think the third pillar for me is probably one of the most important things and, and ultimately for us hard FM sort of provision is about keeping the hospital running. I've experienced firsthand when I worked directly for the NHS, you know, the issues that you can have when theatres have to go out of action because the ventilation system has, has stopped working. Uh, you know, that has a huge impact on the flow of patients through the hospital and has a huge impact on, on, on the financial uh, position as well. Therefore, our key goal is to always ensure that those critical assets are being maintained um, so that that operational uptime is, is, is 100%. Um, then on the fourth pillar, so it's around the sort of financial planning and, and, and cost control, as I'm sure David uh, will, will kind of attest to, there is very limited funding within the NHS. And therefore, we can work with our customers to help identify how that money can be best spent in terms of revenue or in terms of, of, of capital costs. Um, and that actually comes back to the risk piece as well to help manage that, that those risks in the most effective way. And I think the last pillar, and actually as I was thinking about this last night, I'm probably going to split this last pillar into two only because the decarbonisation agenda is so important. But certainly from a capital projects uh, perspective, um, we know that that is, is very important for our customers and we've got a good uh, team that delivers projects uh, with for our existing in customers. Um, and um, then, as I say, the decarbonisation piece, as, as Vincent talked about, um, you know, sustainability is absolutely key for our customers. So kind of working with them 
to help spend money in the best way um, to help them achieve their, their, their objectives. So there for us are the kind of key areas that we're focusing on when we talk about high FM. But underpinning all of that is strong relationships in FM and outsourcing. If you haven't got those relationships in place, none of this other stuff matters. Um, and as I say, we proud ourselves in, in our relationships that we've got um, and we're going to continue to sort of build build on them because I think if you can get the relationships right, if, they're, if there's trust and openness and honesty, then everything else becomes easy. If you haven't got those things in place, um, everything becomes much, much harder. And one thing I, I suppose I wanted to just call out as well. So um, in the bottom left, you'll see that within ISS in the UK, we actually have 300 million of hard FM revenue. Um, which is around 30% of our, of our total turnover. And that is providing services to banks, production units, uh, data centres, uh, education, so lots of different areas. And one of the things I'm trying to do in my role is actually trying to leverage some of that experience and knowledge from the other sectors to bring into healthcare, because there's a lot of synergies uh, from other sectors, you know, as it, especially when we talk around operational uh, uptime. So that's kind of our sort of key pillars of, of what we're looking at when we talk about hard FM. The next slide here is just an example of uh, what you might see on a contract, the different types of data, uh, the different types of information. Uh, you know, you can see from the top, this is where the sort of the inputs come. This is from where the tasks come in. That goes into our into our CAFM system. And one thing I just wanted to pull out. So inside of ISS, this is effectively our sort of our data warehouse that pulls together all the data from the various disparate sources and presents it in a cohesive sort of dashboard type way. Um, and that we give our customers kind of direct access to that so they can see in real time how we are doing across these sort of various KPIs. The other piece I just wanted to pull out uh, on the right track record. So on all of our um, contracts, we've got track records. This is a kind of um, independent assurance and compliance tool because compliance is so important in, in healthcare and that really makes sure that we are um, delivering everything that we need to under you know, our statutory and mandatory uh, obligations. And it tracks not just whether we've done the planned tasks, but actually tracking the remedial activity that, that comes out of that. Because sometimes people will report that they've done the PPM, the, the, the maintenance task, but they don't always track the remedial actions that, that come out of that. One thing I did want to sort of talk about on this slide is is around data. Um, you know, there is more and more data out there, but ultimately, if there isn't a business process that sits behind that data, that data is useless. So it's just making sure that where you're getting your data, what does that actually change? What behaviours does that change? Because otherwise, you've just got a load of spreadsheets. Um, so we're certainly we're trying to make sure that where we're getting data, that we're actually sort of doing something differently with it. Uh, this is just a, a brief slide. So it's one of the things we're looking at around space utilization. So working with our customers to kind of like how well the space is being used, uh, which then obviously turns into potential savings around um, you know, utility costs, cleaning costs, rental income. So trying to use that data to then drive decision making for our customers to make the most effective use of their space. So that's on sort of the hard FM arena. Um, but as I say, we do a lot of work in uh, soft FM. And again, a piece of work that we're doing in, in there is we're kind of going back to the basics and understanding our customers a little bit. And our customers are ultimately our patients. And one of the things we've been doing is sort of mapping out the patient journey. So all the way from sort of pre-admission, when they find out they need to come into the hospital, all the way through to the time that they're discharged or um, get to leave the hospital and really mapping out the different stages of that patient journey and understanding where those touch points might be so those touch points are effectively where ISS could interact with those patients and those touch points are all opportunities for us um, to improve that patient experience obviously if we get things wrong it's you know it's a risk that it, it worsens the patient experience but this is a piece of work that we're doing and you know this then has started to help us identify where you know there's opportunity for innovation. So, for example, with nutrition and, and hydration, we've done a lot of work around food waste, um, not just measuring sort of how much um, 
food is kind of being thrown out in the kitchen, but actually at ward level. So if we can help identify the level of plate waste, so how much food is left on the plate after the patient is eaten, that helps us identify perhaps there's patients that aren't eating enough, and therefore we can work with our customers to sort of flag uh, that up. Other areas where we're looking at um, is around cleaning. So we're doing some stuff with uh, robots, uh, what we call cobotics. So it's working collaboratively with the robots rather than the robots taking over and doing everything for us. Um, but also in cleaning, we're doing some exciting work, uh, taking a more scientific approach to cleaning um, and actually trying, you know, doing lots of sort of analysis to see which areas actually need cleaning um, and therefore, you know, create the greatest risk of infection. So, um, yeah, this is something that we're doing and effectively for all of these touch points, we then zoom in a little bit into those areas to then see, uh, to get into a little bit more granular detail. So when we talk about uh, personal wellbeing, this might mean that it's making sure that, you know, the customers or the patients have got access to refreshments. It's making sure they're able to connect uh, with family or friends. It's making sure they've got spaces to go and rest and, 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 and relax. Um, so this project really, as I say, identifies those patient journeys, identifies where we as a service provider can make a difference, which then helps us um, create solutions to improve that patient experience. So that's something that we're doing in, in Soft FM. And I think the final bit I, I wanted to just talk about a little bit before I, I close is, is around our people. I think, as, as Vincent said, you know, we are a people business, particularly in Soft FM. And ultimately, it's the people that make a difference. When our customers talk about ISS, you know, um, they're not necessarily talking about the ISS marketing or the corporate image. They're talking about their first hand experience of the ISS people, whether it's the managers or the cleaners or, or the porters. And, you know, if you can get the people piece right and you can get the culture piece right, um, then that makes such a difference. And you know, as I say, I've been with ISS for just over three months. And one of the things I've been particularly impressed by is the culture of the organisation in the UK. Um, it's it's welcoming, it's um, empathetic, it's understanding, and you know I've really enjoyed working it. And you can see that culture kind of throughout the organisation. And similar to sort of the slide that Vincent sort of put up, um, you know, for us it's really making sure that our people are taking on that journey all the way from sort of that recruiting piece to, um, you know, if they leave the business and go on to do to greater and, and better things. So we've done a lot of work to identify how we can support our people through that journey. Um, and one thing that we've done recently uh, is trying to sort of develop our, our learning development uh, offer. And I've seen firsthand, so in certain sites we'll have sort of dedicated training spaces and at Lewisham and Greenwich, uh, which we uh, won a couple of years ago, we've actually converted their old kitchen into a, a dedicated training space where there's a mock-up ward and a mock-up kitchen so that our frontline members of staff can be really sort of well trained so that when they go onto the wards, they know exactly um, what, what, what they're doing. Um, so yes, there's some really good stuff that we're, that we're doing um, around the people piece. And then, and then finally for us, you know, as well as the, uh, the frontline staff, this is about the leadership. If we can get the right leadership into our contracts, um, then we can do great things for our, for our customer. Um, and so this slide just sort of shows some of the things that we look at um, when we're sort of training and developing our people. And one of the things I think that I'm particularly happy about is, is hearing stories of where we've got people who have started at frontline as housekeepers or porters, uh, and are now uh, sort of contract managers. Um, you know, that's, I think, a great testament to the culture that, that the ISS have got, the fact that people stay there and then have the opportunity to uh, develop. And that is pretty much the end of my uh, presentation. So, yeah, thank you very much for this, this opportunity. And I think I'm going to briefly hand over to uh, David now. Should I present? Yeah, if you can. Well. Excellent. Thank you uh, very much, James. It was really good to see the the hotelification there of the of the healthcare environment, and it's really really good for those of us who who do work within the um, facilities and, and operation arena to see that reinforcement that that what we do um, is a, a people business. Um, it's it's all about the people, whether it's the people providing the service 
all the people um, receiving the service. So it was really good to hear that reinforced today. So I just wanted to give a very quick update before we go on to questions um, in relation to Guide M. So SIBSI Guide M, Maintenance, Engineering and Management is the go-to guide for um, maintenance and uh, maintenance strategy. Um, it should be um, on everybody's um, desk um, or um, on everybody's hard drive or available to, to download because it really is an, an essential document for those of us who work in um, the, the operational arena. Be that on the hard or the soft side, it's a fantastic document for uh, the soft FM uh, practitioners who need to have an understanding of, of hard FM, especially if it's a uh, soft FM leader having responsibility for both service streams. So it's regularly um, updated. We say regularly every every eight to ten years, and we're currently um, on our uh, latest update at the moment, uh, reflecting uh, changes in best practice, um, impacts of COVID, uh, and of course the, the technology explosion. And we haven't touched today yet on AI, um, which of course has been mentioned um, prolifically in the news um, over the last few weeks. So maybe there'll be a question around that. Um, so I'm not going to go through these. These are the um, the audiences and I've, I've touched on desks and where this document should be held. And the most important thing there is for designers. I don't think it's ever been more important than it currently is now that designers need to be aware of how uh, the services that they are designing will be uh, operated, uh, maintained. Um, especially in relation to um, circular economy, uh, life cycle, etc., and understanding what maintenance strategy um, will need to be required for the, the buildings that are being designed. So, yeah, very, very important for designers. Um, it's all written by volunteers. Um, so we, we've all got uh, chapters or section of chapters, and then it's overseen um, by a, a, a senior reviewer. And the whole thing is being led by um, Joanna Harris, and this is, I, I think, Joanna's second or third involvement with the update of this. And it's a fantastic piece of work she's doing on this. Um, so this is the first time it's moving away from uh, a, a book. Um, it's standalone chapters. So if designers, maintainers, etc., only need to delve into a, a specific chapter, that can be done. It also enables us to be able to update chapters more frequently as opposed to having it in, in a paper format. There will, of course, be a, a book, but that, that will be electronic. We anticipate that we will be releasing this in September and we'll be fully communicating uh, with everybody in relation to, to this um, event. It will, of course, be hybrid and at, at a... Um, iconic location i would hope in central london so please be prepared for this to come out we're still working on a few of the chapters still doing a final uh, review and a sense check of it and then it will be out for um publication that is it so i need to stop sharing but making sure i don't hang up um so it's that one there isn't it there we go excellent i didn't hang up so Thank you to Vincent and James. And just whilst I've got the microphone, thank you especially to Jack uh, for being here in person and coming across from Ballam, Sibsey Central to assist with this today. And for Ella in the background online, making sure that everything's working correctly. We couldn't have done this today without you. Do we have any questions? I'm sure we've got questions in the room. Um, I've already perhaps given an indication as to what I might ask, but do we have any questions in chat or anybody who wants to come? I can see that there is a hand up, but I think that hand has been up throughout the entire um, time that we've been presenting. But if that is your hand and you would like to ask a question, please do open your microphone and ask a question. OK, I'll take it that that's a legacy hand. We do, however, have a real live hand in the room and um, we're going to Parag, I believe, for the first question. Yeah, is it, can I just do I have to go to somewhere to speak? Or no, you can get yeah. OK, the uh, question for James, uh, you know, you talked about decarbonization. I work a lot on that and I think I'd like to hear your view on. Um, and we organize an event since the FM, what the FM role is in decarbonization. I'd like to hear your view on like, you know, there are now targets and how do how do you play a role? How do FMs, how can we play a more effective role in this journey? Sure. 
so I think I mean interesting so when I was at Guys at St Thomas's Hospital I was kind of headed up we launched our our green plan so all NHS organisations have to now have a, a green plan to achieve that you know the, the, the commitment of, of getting to carbon zero uh, and I think where can we go about I mean so there are obviously the sort of the, the obvious projects around you know heat pumps or or EV charging and, and things like that I think one of the areas where we were able to sort of really work well was to try and actually coordinate these large organizations to actually achieve some of these projects because one of the things we found was it's one thing to come up with an initiative to get rid of um, single-use coffee stirrers as an example uh, and you would have thought that would be relatively straightforward but actually in these big organizations where you have infection prevention involved and you have procurement involved and you have lots of different kind of stakeholders one of the areas where we can often add value is trying to bring those kind of stakeholders together to all sort of pull in the same direction. So I think there's something around just coordinating these projects because without that, these things don't tend to happen. But I think then there is a piece around certainly us with our sort of our scope. We can bring other ideas in from other industries. So whether it's banking, whether it's education, uh, you know, bringing some of those knowledge and best practice into yeah, into our other customers are uh, and trying to sort of leverage that 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 global scale. So you know whether it's stuff we're doing abroad or in the UK, just bringing some of those ideas in. So I think it's it's working with our customers to actually push some of these trickier projects through, and then it's also then using our sort of more global capacity to bring in sort of innovation from from other sectors and other countries. Brilliant, thank you, James, and thank you, Parag. I can't see any questions in the chat. I'm just going to cross to Jack, not get any yet. Um, so I think Vincent and James, you, you both mentioned technology and you, you touched there on Internet of Things. Um, what do you see as the, the, the change or the developments in relation to um, artificial intelligence? Be it as, as a, an opportunity or a threat. Have you started to see anything emerging from, from the tech or software side with regards to AI? Maybe, maybe, maybe I'll leave, uh, I should I need to be first. Um, if talk about AI, I think it must be uh, one of the another uh, new trend in the future. Um, but uh, if talking about facility management, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, even for the uh, basic technology, uh, we think that uh, not every, I would, I would say, uh, not all the customer uh, right now uh, using the BMS, <laughs> the one of the uh, quite typical and normal uh, automatic control system. And um, so still, uh, a little gap at the moment, I would say, uh, because maybe, you know, in the past, uh, most of the, um, the partner um, right now already age, in age, uh, in Asian condition, you know. So this is, uh, I think, uh, the most important thing is to uh, <clears throat> not talk about AI further, but of course, AI would be one of the uh, further in the future, the trend, uh, to make use of some system uh, by the more uh, analysis and, more, and, and and some of the development. But um, the uh, existing condition, I would say, uh, we have to invest a little bit more about um, to to influence and encourage uh, the, the the people to make use of the uh, current technology first. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. Uh, James? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, particularly around the sort of the sustainability agenda, I think there's some really interesting use of technology. One of the things I've seen is um, a little black box that effectively sits on the distribution board that measures kind of energy uses at a very granular level. So you can tell kind of what your air handling unit is using from an energy perspective. But the bit for me that gets interesting is as well as measuring energy usage, it measures sort of a harmonization so every bit of kit kind of puts out a unique sort of harmonization uh, and actually with AI so that we know what your standard sort of harmonization should look like for that air handling unit um, and if it starts to go outside of certain parameters 
that flags up uh, an issue or a task, the engineer goes to visit it and then may go and then realize that I don't know, something needs to be adjusted. But they take that information, they put that back into the system. So that actually, if that sort of uh, information occurs again, the system will know, right, you know, something needs to be adjusted. So I think taking that technology and using sort of machine learning um, and then that links to that predictive maintenance bit so that actually when a certain um, data set is outside of a parameter, you know that something's going to go wrong and therefore you can actually fix it before it goes wrong, uh, you know, which then comes back to that sort of operational uptime. So there's, there's some stuff around the energy consumption piece, um, but then also using that to then turn into the sort of predictive maintenance. And I think the final point to that though is you know, when you're looking at energy, so if, if, if lights are being left on overnight, using technology to flag up to the manager of that area to say, look, last night your lights were, were, were left on overnight. So it's, it's making sure that the technology drives a behavioural change, because if it doesn't, all you've got is some more information on a, on a spreadsheet. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Yeah, sensor tech um, certainly isn't used anywhere near as much as it as it should be. Um, we have a question in from our Hong Kong members, uh, we, uh, and it's just disappeared because another question came in. Uh, so let me just go back. Essentially, the question was what um, shortages in staff, um, hard FM staff, are we experiencing in the UK? So I, I've got a view on that, but I think, James, it would be really good to understand as, as a large employer um, any areas you're struggling perhaps to to recruit and retain mm -hmm. in relation to um, trade staff potentially and um, yeah I mean it, it is it is it is challenging particularly kind of down south where you know there's a lot of construction work and therefore there is a real demand on those on those trades I have to say I think actually from a private sector we've probably got a benefit over the NHS because the NHS have some quite fixed sort of payment sort of pay T's and C's um, and they can't go outside of that so I know my own personal experience of when I worked directly for the NHS it was incredibly hard to recruit uh, and, and and retain so I mean yeah generally there's there's issues across um, across the board and I think that's why as a business you know what we try and focus on is how to retain those staff of course salary is a is a key component of, of what keep people sort of motivated engage but actually there's a lot more uh than that and then, you know if we can make people feel that they're part of a, a bigger purpose if we can support them with learning development um you know, apprenticeships and, and, and the like then that can help us uh not only recruit but also retain people because you know the cost of recruitment is 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 is, is a lot um so yes there are shortages um and yes it's challenging but we believe that you know by offering some of the other stuff that hopefully we can, you know, we can attract and keep uh, the best, the best talent. Brilliant, thanks, James. And yeah, that is the, the, the drive for apprenticeships in the UK is is very high at the moment, especially uh, in the NHS. So the NHS estates and, and facilities um, have got a target of a thousand additional um, apprentices um, in this in this current uh, year. Um, so yeah, we're, we're we are struggling to, to to recruit, and also we're seeing a shift towards uh, multi-skilling, multi-skilling uh, technicians as opposed to the traditional um, service streams of plumber, fitter, um, electrician, um, having that 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 um, all rounder. Uh, in addition, of course, to those means that you can um, get a lot more done. Um, there is another question coming in. We should be uh, promoting open protocol BMS systems. Um, I'm trying to paraphrase here. Um, it proves the most trouble, troublesome PPM item, and by having it open protocol, um, it allows IoT um, to use uh, generic rather than proprietary control systems. Um, I think it's more of a, a statement there as, as opposed to a question. But but would would you concur? <laughs> o open source software for BMS is. Is the future? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in Hong Kong, yes. <laughs> of course, uh, not just only some proprietary product. Uh, most of the the trend, I would say, most of the manufacturer right now is uh, also using open language. Mm -hmm. That means uh, universal language that every uh, the 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 terminal, the end terminal units can connect with and can communicate with. So this must be yeah the current practice. And yeah, I, 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 I would agree. I think, I mean, certainly when you look at software systems, the key thing as well is the, the interoperability piece. Uh, we're not going to end up with one system that does everything. <laughs> the future is, is going to be multiple systems that, that play nice to each other. Um, and I think 
you know, newer, newer systems do that. I think your, your challenge sometimes is where you link in legacy systems with mm -hmm. newer systems. That, that yeah. creates an issue. But I, I think certainly yeah, the industry seems to be moving more towards that sort of open protocol, kind of open APIs. Um, yeah. Thanks, James. And, and on that note, we'll, we'll draw it to a close. Um, thanks again to ISS for hosting and providing two fantastic speakers for us today um, to give us that international uh, flavour for, for FM, what we do, innovation, best practice, etc. Please keep the conversation going. You can find us um, individually and as organisations, and the SIBS FM group is on LinkedIn. Um, we've got the, the Twitter accounts. Again, I'm sure we've all got personal accounts as well as Twitter accounts. Please do keep this conversation going because it's only by having these continued conversations that we can all do um, better uh, as an industry. So thank you very much for joining us, especially those from Hong Kong. It's been fantastic to have this joint event with the Hong Kong region and to have you join us today. So thank you all very, very much and hope to see you at an event soon. Bye. Bye-bye.